His Excellency, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Mr. President of the Human Rights Council, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Human rights are the bedrock of peace. Today, both are under attack. We meet at a time of turbulence for our world, for people, and for human rights. First and foremost, conflicts are taking a terrible toll as parties to war trample on human rights and humanitarian law. At the local level and online, many communities are riven with violent rhetoric, discrimination, and hate speech. Add to that an information war, a war on the poor, and a war on nature. All these battles have one thing in common, they are a war on fundamental human rights. And in every case, the path to peace begins with full respect for all human rights, civil, cultural, economic, political, and social, and without double standards. Because building a culture of human rights is building a world at peace. I commend the critical contributions of the Human Rights Council towards this goal, through its mandates and mechanisms and the response to evolving situations. Excellencies, our world is becoming less safe by the day. After decades of stable power relations, we are transitioning into an era of multipolarity. And this creates new opportunities for leadership and justice on the international stage. But multipolarity without strong multilateral institutions is a recipe for chaos. As powers compete, tensions rise. The rule of law and rules of war are being undermined. From Ukraine to Sudan to Myanmar, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Gaza, parties to conflict are turning a blind eye to international law, the Geneva Conventions and even the United Nations Charter. The Security Council is often deadlocked, unable to act on the most significant peace and security issues of our time. The Council's lack of unity on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and on Israel's military operations in Gaza following the horrific terror attacks by Hamas on 7 October has severely, perhaps fatally, undermined its authority. The Council needs serious reform to its composition and working methods. Nothing can justify humans' deliberate killing, injuring, torturing and kidnapping of civilians the use of sexual violence, and the indiscriminate launching of rockets towards Israel. But nothing justifies the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. I invoked Article 99 for the first time in my mandate to put the greatest possible pressure on the Council to do everything in its power to end the bloodshed in Gaza and prevent escalation. But it was not enough. International humanitarian law remains under attack Tens of thousands of civilians, including women and children, have been killed in Gaza. Humanitarian aid is still completely insufficient. Rafa is the core of the humanitarian aid operation, and UNRWA is the backbone of that effort. An all-out all Israeli offensive on the city would not only be terrifying for more than a million Palestinian civilians sheltering there, it would put the final nail in the coffin of our aid programs. I repeat my call for a humanitarian ceasefire and the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. Excellencies, around the world violence is increasing and conflict-related human rights violations are spreading. International human rights and humanitarian law are clear. All parties must distinguish between civilians and combatants at all times. Attacks on civilians or protected infrastructure, including schools and hospitals, are prohibited. Indiscriminate attacks are prohibited. Attacks where the likelihood of civilian death is disproportionate to the probable military advantage are prohibited. Forced displacement is prohibited. The taking and holding of hostages is prohibited. The use of civilian human shields is prohibited. Collective punishment is prohibited. The use of sexual violence as a weapon of war is prohibited. And violations by one party do not absolve the other 
form compliance. We cannot, we must not, become numb to appalling and repeated violations of international humanitarian and human rights law. All allegations of serious violations and abuses demand urgent investigation and accountability. And we are determined to take such action in relation to allegations against our own staff. Excellencies, the Geneva Conventions, which require the protection of civilians and the humane treatment of people in enemy ends, were not the result of an outbreak of global goodwill. These treaties were agreed because they protect everyone. Around the world, warring parties claim exemptions, asserting that certain people or situations are uniquely dangerous. But flouting international law only feeds insecurity and results in more bloodshed. Human rights conventions and humanitarian law are based on cold, hard reality. They recognize that terrorizing civilians and depriving them of food, water, and health care is a recipe for endless anger, alienation, extremism, and conflict. Today's warmongers cannot erase the clear lesson of the past. Protecting human rights protects us all. We urgently need a new commitment to all human rights, civil, cultural, economic, political, and social, as they apply to peace and security, backed by serious efforts at implementation and accountability. And states have the primary responsibility to protect and promote human rights. To support states in meeting their obligations, I'm launching a system-wide United Nations Agenda for Protection together with the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Under the agenda, the United Nations, across the full spectrum of our work, will act as one to prevent human rights violations and to identify and respond to them when they take place. That is the protection pledge of all United Nations bodies to do their utmost to protect people. Excellencies, around the world, governments must step up and commit to working for peace and security rooted in human rights. The Summit of the Future in September is our opportunity for such a recommitment. The new agenda for peace to be discussed at the summit applies a human rights lens to preventing and ending violence in all its forms. Building on our call to action for human rights, it urges an end to reflexive responses to violence, underscoring the need for strategic, comprehensive approaches that address root causes. Successful peace processes from Colombia to Northern Ireland demonstrate that the full spectrum of human rights is indispensable to building peace. The new Agenda for Peace recognizes that security policies that ignore human rights can divide communities, exacerbate inequalities, and drive people towards extremism. It calls for all military engagement to respect human rights and humanitarian law, and to be backed by political and development strategies. It urges security policies centered on people with the full and equal participation of women and the strong representation of young people. It calls for human rights to be at the heart of the governance of new weapons technologies, including artificial intelligence, and seeks the total prohibition of little autonomous weapons with the power to kill without human involvement. It affirms that human rights and humanitarian law apply in cyberspace, and it calls for much closer cooperation between the UN's human rights frameworks, the Security Council and the Peacebuilding Commission, to address violations and put human rights at the core of peace operations. Excellencies, the new agenda for peace also addresses the links between human rights violations and violence at community level. From the epidemic of violence against women and girls, to the activities of criminal gangs, to rising anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim bigotry, the persecution of minority Christian communities, and discrimination against minorities of all kinds, Many people do not feel safe in their own communities. Media workers and human rights defenders are frequently targeted, sometimes as part of a strategy to reduce civic space and silence criticism. Decades of progress on women's and girls' rights are being challenged and rolled back, including their fundamental right to education and health care and their sexual and reproductive rights. The new Agenda for Peace urges governments to create space in national security policies 
for civil society, human rights defenders, and those representing vulnerable and marginalized people. Freedom of the media, freedom of expression, and an open, inclusive civic space are essential to peaceful, democratic societies. It calls for the dismantling and transformation of power structures that discriminate against women and girls, and for concrete steps to secure women's full, equal, and meaningful participation at all levels of decision-making on peace and security. And it presses for young people to be included in, as participants in decision-making on peace and security events. We're also setting our ways to tackle online abuses of human rights and support people's rights to connectivity and privacy online through our forthcoming Code of Conduct for Information Integrity and the Global Digital Compact. Peaceful communities require an open, secure, accessible digital public space that supports human rights and freedoms. Excellence, les guerres ne se limitent pas au champ de bataille. Certaines politiques économiques actuelles, à l'échelle nationale comme au niveau mondial, constituent une guerre contre les pauvres et contre les droits humains. De nombreuses économies en développement peinent encore à se relever du double choc de la pandémie du Covid-19 et de l'invasion russe de l'Ukraine. Les objectifs de développement durable sont très loin d'être atteints. Rien que cette année, les pays les plus pauvres du monde doivent verser plus de 185 milliards de dollars en service de la dette, soit plus que le total de leurs dépenses publiques en matière de santé, d'éducation et d'infrastructure. L'absence de bouée de sauvetage face à la dette met en péril la capacité de millions de personnes à jouir de leurs droits, à l'eau potable, à une alimentation nutritive, à l'éducation, aux soins de santé et à l'emploi. L'architecture financière mondiale est au cœur de cette crise des droits humains. Elle est obsolète, dysfonctionnelle et injuste, et doit être réformée afin de fournir des financements à long terme et à faible coût et constituer un filet de sécurité efficace pour tous les pays qui en ont besoin. Nous demandons l'adoption d'un plan de relance des ODD à la hauteur de 500 milliards de dollars par an, afin que les pays en développement puissent accéder à des financements abordables et à long terme. Et nous appelons également de nos voeux à un nouveau Bretton Woods afin de remodeler l'architecture financière mondiale pour qu'elle reflète le monde d'aujourd'hui et non celui d'il y a 80 ans. Le sommet de l'avenir sera l'occasion d'envisager des réformes profondes visant à rendre les cadres de financement mondiaux plus inclusifs, équitables et justes afin qu'ils puissent aider les gouvernements à donner la priorité aux dépenses sociales, au développement durable et à l'action climatique essentielle aux droits humains. Le Sommet social mondial et la Conférence internationale sur le financement au développement, qui se tiendront l'année prochaine, mettront l'accent sur la manière dont les politiques économiques, y compris les budgets, les mesures fiscales et les subventions, peuvent renforcer les investissements dans les objectifs de développement durable et les droits humains pour toutes et tous. Excellences, chers amis, notre guerre contre la nature est une guerre contre les droits humains de personnes qui comptent parmi les plus vulnérables au monde, les peuples autochtones, les communautés rurales, les personnes marginalisées et les plus démunies. Les crises qui frappent notre planète, le changement climatique, la perte de biodiversité et la pollution portent toutes en elles la même injustice profonde. Ce sont les personnes qui ont le moins contribué à ces crises, qui en paient le prix fort et subissent de plein fouet l'aggravation de la faim et de la famine, la dégradation des terres, le déploiement, for le déploiement forcé, la contamination des sources d'eau ou les décès prématurés. La reconnaissance du droit à un environnement propre, sain et durable par le Conseil des droits de l'homme en 2021 et par l'Assemblée générale en 2022 montre que les temps changent. La justice environnementale et la justice climatique sont des cris de ralliement en faveur d'un traitement équitable et éthique du principe de responsabilité et des droits humains. La justice climatique exige que les pays du G20 montre la voie dans l'élimination progressive des combustibles fossiles. 
Elle exige que toutes les contributions déterminées au niveau national ou plans climatiques nationaux soient alignées sur la limite maximale de 1,5 degré pour le réchauffement de la planète. Elle exige un prix de carbone effectif et la fin de subventions accordées aux combustibles fossiles. La justice climatique exige des pays développés qu'ils honorent leurs engagements financiers à l'égard des économies en développement, en commençant par celui de mobiliser les 100 milliards de dollars par an et de doubler le financement de l'adaptation d'ici à 2025. Enfin, elle exige que le Fonds pour les pertes et dommages soit opérationnel le plus rapidement possible et reçoive des contributions significatives. Pour de nombreux pays du Sud, la justice économique, environnementale et climatique est le principal défi de notre époque en matière de droits humains. L'Organisation des Nations Unies se joint à eux pour appeler à tous les pays pour qu'ils assument leurs responsabilités. Excellence, notre monde change à une vitesse vertigineuse. La multiplication des conflits provoque des souffrances, provoque des souffrances sans précédent, mais les droits humains sont une constante. Ils donnent de la cohérence à notre quête de solutions et ils sont fondamentaux pour nos espoirs d'un monde en paix. Il y a quatre ans, l'Organisation des Nations Unies a célébré son 75e anniversaire en lançant une enquête mondiale. Les citoyens du monde entier ont déclaré à une écrasante majorité qu'ils souhaitaient que les dirigeants mondiaux accordent la priorité aux droits humains et qu'ils les respectent. Cet appel a été repris lors de la célébration du 75e anniversaire de la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme en décembre dernier. Cette année, le Sommet de l'Avenir nous donne l'occasion de répondre à cette demande et de faire en sorte que nos institutions mondiales soient en phase avec la réalité en constante évolution d'aujourd'hui et de pleinement adhérer aux valeurs immuables des droits humains. Ensemble, saisissons cette occasion pour faire avancer la paix et les droits humains pour toutes et pour tous. Et je vous remercie. Je remercie, Monsieur le Secrétaire général.